Well, hello and good evening, everyone. Uh, as you probably gathered by now, my name is David Nutt. I'm a psychiatrist, neuropsychopharmacologist uh, at Imperial College London. And it's a great pleasure to talk to you tonight about this topic, the modern state of psychedelic research. But before we get to the present day, let's look back a few thousand years and understand where psychedelics have come from and uh, which ones we're talking about. So if you look at this image, on the top left, you have uh, the peyote cactus, which makes mescaline. And then you have the magic mushrooms, which 200 species of which make psilocybin. Top right-hand side, you have ayahuasca, this drinkable form of DMT, discovered by the indigenous peoples of the Amazon. Bottom right, you have a different kind of psychedelic. The uh, This is the Amanita muscaris. Uh, it's a GABA as opposed to a serotonergic psychedelic, and I, I won't be talking more about that tonight. And then across the bottom, morning glory seeds, morning glory, which seeds of which contain a lysergic acid derivative, as do the ergot fungi that grow on rye. And the most important image here is the bottom left-hand one. So that's a 3,000-year-old Greek vase. And it shows the Greek god Demeter partaking of ergot and wine. And that combination fueled the famous Eleusinian mysteries, those celebrations of dance, theater, art, music that were central to Greek culture for many hundreds of years. And, and after those mysteries, the Greeks returned to their uh, city-states from their parties and carried on doing the things that we know they were good at, uh, uh, such as uh, geometry, logic, and also the development of constructs such as democracy. And since most of Western culture is, to some extent, based on the uh, under our understanding and our appreciation of, of those Greek intellectuals, you can make a reasonable case that psychedelics uh, were party to the whole generation of Western culture. And in fact, you can make similar cases to for the generation of other cultures as well. I don't have the time to go into that today. If we fast forward now to the beginning of the modern era, we uh, see this quote from William James, one of the founding fathers of the discipline of psychology, who thought long and hard about the nature of consciousness. And after taking mescaline and nitrous oxide, he wrote this, a normal waking consciousness is but one special type of consciousness. Whilst all about it, parted from it by the filmiest of screens, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. And then I've highlighted the next bit. No account of the universe in its totality can be final. That leaves these disregarded. And the reason I've emphasized that, because I think that is a challenge which a uh, hundred years on, we're now able to pick up. But understanding the nature of altered consciousness is one of the great challenges of science equally important as studying the origins of the universe or the components of subatomic particles. But how to regard them is the question, for they are so discontinuous with ordinary consciousness. Now, James pioneered the use of nitrous oxide in particular to explore altered um, states of consciousness, but he didn't have the imaging technologies we have, and that's where the big revolution, the modern revolution in psychedelic understanding has emerged from. Of course, in the public arena, this man really did more than anyone to make people interested in the nature of altered consciousness. This is um, Aldous Huxley, uh, who, having written about written dystopian novels like Brave New World, then uh, took mescaline, and it changed his mind, and, and in such a profound way that he he sought to make sense of it using this quote from the English mystic and uh, painter and writer, William Blake. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. And that's why the book's called The Doors of Perception, because Huxley realized that mescaline had opened the doors to his perception. But he went beyond that. He then thought, well, hang on, if the doors are being opened by mescaline, something must be closing them. What is that? And he came to this conclusion, the brain is an instrument for focusing the mind. And mescaline turned off the brain and allowed the mind to do things differently, and in many cases better. And one of the wonder, wonders of our modern neuroscience understanding 
it's, he was exactly right. Now, about the same time as uh, Huxley was trying mescaline, this man, Albert Hoffman, was making LSD available for researchers. He discovered it in the late 1940s, uh, and he persuaded his company to make it available for research. And this is a picture of him aged 100, and the first British person to uh, take uh, LSD was Joel Elkies, a psychiatrist in Birmingham. And I just emphasize the fact that these early pioneers of psychedelic research both lived to over 100. And whether that's due to the fact that they took LSD is not proven, but it certainly argues against claims by the CIA and other groups that drugs like LSD destroy your brain. It's possible they do the opposite. Because in those days, com drug companies like Sando, who Hoffman worked for, were open-minded and interested in science rather than just profit. Uh, they made LSD available in that box there. There's the LSD tablets. And they also made psilocybin available after Hoffman had worked out in 1957 that psilocybin was rather similar to LSD in its chemistry and its um, uh, effects on the brain. Uh, and these two different medicines were used by the psychiatric profession to do various things, like to model psychosis, to help doctors, psychiatrists understand what it's like to have an altered consciousness so they could be more sympathetic with their patients. But particularly, they were used for therapy. And there were two kinds of therapy, one called psychedelic psychotherapy, which is what we tend to do today, which is a big dose, big single dose. People have profound experiences, often of a mystical nature, uh, out of which they come changed, obviously, mostly for the better. That was the approach favoured in the US. In the UK, we're being a little bit more uh, cautious and we tended to use a lower dose of these drugs, uh, giving a lower dose before each psychotherapy session. It was called psycholytic psychotherapy. And the idea was that these drugs would loosen the resistance that people had to engaging in the psychotherapy and so benefit from it. And we're also doing that today. We're doing a study in patients with OCD who've told us categorically they will not have a trip. They cannot bear the thought of losing control even if it might help them. So now we're using low doses, um, lower doses to help them engage better in their psychotherapy without having a full-blown trip. And because of the generosity of Sando and because of the amazing investment by the US National Institute of Health, who funded over 130 grants, there was a massive amount of research done in the 50s and 60s on these drugs. There were the revolution in psychiatry. That for the first time, psychiatry had tools to explore the brain and the mind. And a thousand clinical papers were published out of 40,000 patients, 40 books, six international conferences. And in 1971, when all this research was banned by the UN conventions, Masters and Houston put together an overview, coming to the conclusion that results were overwhelmingly positive, describing safe and effective treatments. But why were they banned and why don't we use them? Well, they were banned remarkably in the face of opposition from this man here, Bobby Kennedy, who would have been president if he hadn't been assassinated, the most powerful man in the world, who's talking to his, his regulators, his bureaucrats. And he's saying to them, why if these clinical LSD projects, when we spent billions of dollars on them, were worthwhile six months ago, why aren't they worthwhile now? We keep going around and around. If I could get a flat answer about that, I'd be happy. Is there a misunderstanding about my question? He knew he was being lied to. And he went on to say, I think perhaps we've lost sight of the fact that LSD can be very, very helpful in our society if used properly. I mean, even he couldn't stop this inexorable pressure of banning things and won't be lost on any of you that that process still goes on today. But the absurdity of banning everything, which has started back in the 1930s, uh, has led to the banning of psychedelics. And this is the worst censorship of research in the history of the world, because they didn't just ban these drugs for recreational use or self-experimentation, they banned them for medical use, even though they were medicines. No other drug that was a medicine has been banned. And the reason they did that, of course, is because psychedelics were changing the way people viewed the conventional approach uh, of American foreign policy, which was to drop a lot of bombs in Southeast Asia. But we're fighting back now, and the science is leading that. This graph just shows you how emphatic this censorship has been. So the blue line is the number of papers with LSD published each year, and the red with psilocybin 
And you can see there's this massive increase because there's a huge investment in research. And then after the US bans in 67, the UN bans in 71, there's a cataclysmic fall off. And there are two reasons for that. One is that the US government, which is the way the largest funder of research in the world, stopped funding any studies. In fact, they haven't funded a study in nearly uh, 55 years. That just started last year. Uh, and the second is if you get money from philanthropists to do this research, you couldn't get the drug because the, the DEA and the FD, FDA and the CIA effectively stopped access. And there was a deliberate ploy, I think, to eliminate all knowledge of psychedelics. And they nearly succeeded. Look, in 1990 and 91, not a single paper on psilocybin was published. But you can see we're beginning to fight back. So I'm going to move now into the science of these drugs, and I start with the pharmacology. So all these drugs that I'm going to talk about, which is LSD, DMT, psilocybin, mescaline, they all bind to the serotonin 2A receptor, and they all stimulate the, that receptor. And so do lots of other psychedelic drugs which are on this chart, but I'm not going to detail. These drugs turn on a serotonin receptor in the brain, and these receptors are remarkable because they're loaded in the parts of the brain which are the most recently evolved parts of the brain the parts of the brain which distinguish human brains from other primate brains the parts of the brain in which we do all these high level human tasks like thinking about the future like imagining new ways of behaving new ways of doing things inventing things uh, socializing this is uh, these receptors are more densely expressed in human brain than any other brain in these highly evolved parts of the brain they seem to be central to the nature of human human consciousness and and human uh, the human brain as ability to do so many more things than uh, other brains. And they're on a particular group of neurons in the brain. And for those of you who don't know much about neuroscience, in a very simple way, the brain is like a three dimensional computer. The, the first two dimensions of these this, this dimension, uh, these linear dimensions in the cortex, where each of these uh, rows of neurons are called a, are like a little computer and there's there's hundreds of billions of these com little computers in your brain but joining them all up to, to create the massive power of the human brain which has more power than all the computers on earth put together the joining up of all these mini computers is done by these layer five pyramidal cells and they they're the cells that connect across the brain and that and they bring together this massive computing power and they are loaded with the receptors, these serotonin receptors. And if you stimulate these receptors with psychedelics, these cells depolarize like crazy. They produce you know, a fundamentally different state of activity. And that alters the connectivity of the brain in a, in a powerful way, which it turns out explains the loosening of a, a consciousness in the psychedelic state, the generation of new ideas, new ways of thinking, because we break down the ongoing classical ways in which the brain has been functioning. But I'm getting my head ahead of myself a little bit because I want to go historically back to the very first study we did, which was published 10 years ago now. The first ever brain imaging study using fMRI in people who were given a psychedelic, psilocybin. These results show a color coding, which is very important. When you see these images, blue means less activity either less blood flow or less brain activity. In our first study, we found that our volunteers who had full range of interesting experiences, hallucinations, a sense of their body morphing out, floating through space. One went to God and bowed at the foot of God. And then they all came back and then we analyzed their brains and we discovered that there was no increased activity anywhere. There were just decreased is in activity. Told us that Timothy Leary was wrong. We don't turn on the brain. But we couldn't quite make sense as to why turning off the brain led to a psychedelic experience. In fact, we repeated it using a different form of, Im of brain uh, fMRI imaging, got the same results. And we came to the conclusion that actually psychedelics were disrupting brain function in a fundamental way, particularly disrupting the centers of the brain, which you saw in our previous image, which turned out from other work, looking at the brain connectome, to be the hubs of brain activity. There are two main hubs. You, they're put in, and you can see them here inside those yellow circles. The one at the front of the brain, the top one, is the frontal one, the anterior cingulate cortex. And that integrates your thinking, your planning, your anticipation, your memory, and your emotions. And the one at the back, 
the lower yellow circle there, that's a posterior cingulate cortex, and that integrates all your senses, your sense of, uh, of, of vision and hearing and touch and proprioception and smell, etc. And those are the two conductors of the brain's orchestra. And we thought then that what was what's happening with psychedelics is you were switching off the, the control centers, you're taking the conductor out of the orchestra, and that allows the orchestra to decide what it wants to play itself rather than be constrained to play what the conductor tells it. And that liberation of brain activity is what underpins the psychedelic state. And what was really elegant about this discovery of ours was that it actually fitted exactly with what Huxley predicted. He said that the brain controlled the mind and mescaline, in doing so, producing the state of altered consciousness, lower, it does it through lowering the efficiency of the brain as an instrument for focusing the mind. So that's now something we have shown. Now, if you change the way the brain works, you can actually get a very interesting outcomes. So on the left-hand image here, uh, you see normal connectivity in the brain. And both of those two images have got the same number of connections. But on the left-hand side, in the normal brain, most of the connections are around the edge. That's called the small world brain, the visual cortex, or it's the visual cortex, auditory cortex, auditory cortex. Of course, there has to be some crosstalk. If you see a bus bearing down on it, you've got to get your legs moving to run out of the way. But the massive efficiency of the brain, which is 10 times more efficient than any human human-made computer, comes from the fact that most of the connectivity is very local, energy efficient. But under psychedelics, connectivity massively increases. And in fact, what you're doing here is you're putting the brain back to the state it was when you were a young baby, when all parts of the brain could talk to each other. And one of the processes of, of development and education is to take this completely flexible, hyper-connected brain and constrain it to the left-hand brain, where actually you do things very efficiently, but in a very limited fashion. And in conditions like depression or OCD, that limitation can become so hardwired that you actually do things wrongly, which are destructive to you, but you can't escape from them. This is a beautiful image from our paper, the first study ever of LSD uh, using fMRI. And you see here, again, uh, the very limited connectivity of the brain under placebo on the left, and the massive connectivity of the brain under LSD. And that massive connectivity, the visual cortex, those green bits at the back, they connect to everywhere under LSD. And that's why people have such profound and uh, memorable visual hallucinations. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.